Good morning, Lakeshore Church. Good morning. Good morning. It is such a pleasure to have you once again in the house of the Lord, ready to come and worship with us this morning. I'm going to invite you all to stand up on your feet. We want to welcome those who are following with us online. It is a good time to just get into that space of worship. We're going to sing a great song. It's called House of the Lord because we are welcoming his presence in this place. Amen. Amen.
forever. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite Pastor Allen to come forward for a special word. Poor people online, my apologies. I'll get used to it. I'll get used to it. These are rookie mistakes, that's for sure. My apologies. Um, yeah, we're going to pray for the Pacific, which is a, a vast array of, uh, of islands throughout the Pacific. Um, obviously, the most uh, well-known, the largest is Australia, which is really a continent, and uh, New Zealand. But you've got Fiji, the Samoans, um, Papua New Guinea, um, fortunate to be, uh, to have the Christian gospel relatively early, and so almost 75% of the people are Christian, but uh, probably less than 20% would be what we would call evangelical, so they need uh, uh, a revival of the spirit among, uh, among many of them, um, but we want to pray for them, but I have another thing on my, my mind as we're, it's Communion Sunday, and that is to pray for all those who come in with troubles, with uh, maybe you're even tired of life and its responsibilities, and we want to think of you. At the end of Matthew chapter 11, there is um, a wonderful invitation that many of you would be familiar with. If you're not, it's, it's uh, um, something to look forward to uh, getting acquainted with. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke, that is my responsibility. The life I offer, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And because I am humble, a gentle and humble of heart. This is Jesus who created the world and who will bring down evil and darkness. He's gentle and humble of heart. I like the word at the beginning, it is all. The invitation is come all who are weary and heavy burdened. There's no exceptions. In fact, the more troubled you are, the more weary you are, the more the invitation is for you. So there are no exceptions. But take up his yoke because he is, and learn from him because he's humble and gentle of heart. Take up my, uh, my yoke upon you. For my, my yoke, he says, is easy and light. Amen? What a promise that is. Amen. Well, let's pray, shall we? Will you join with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And no corner of this vast world is not uh, under your gaze, under your care. It may not seem to us like it because there is so much that goes on in the world that is uh, not according to your plan and your purpose. The evil one seems to be running rampant in so many areas of our world. But we know in the mighty name of Jesus that your spirit can reach those areas, reach those people. And so, Lord, we pray for the Pacific and uh, those vast number of islands where people can feel isolated, alone. Um, the opportunities for employment don't seem to be there. And so we pray, Lord, that there would be an encouragement from your spirit that there would be new opportunities, there would be new developments that would give hope to people. And above all, Lord, we pray for the message of Jesus Christ. The hope of eternity would uh, strengthen hearts around that vast area. We pray in Jesus' name, and I pray, Lord, for those of us here as we come to communion, if there's someone here who has ventured in beyond their comfort zone, Pray that you bless them. Pray that they know from a witness of your spirit that they are in the right place and that you have a word for them, that you will encourage them and strengthen them for the responsibilities you've given them. And they will.
you for the cross, Lord God. You have given us that foundation that we can plant our feet in, Lord God. But beyond that, you have given us the sacrifice of your son, Lord. You have given us your blood, Lord. Hallelujah. What a sacrifice of love that God
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, there is nothing that can separate us from you. Nothing. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence, your love. Lord, the very forgiveness that you extend to each one of us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may take your seats. We're going to enter this special moment of communion, of time of Holy Supper with our, our Lord this morning. We're going to do it a little bit, uh, just a little differently than what we've done in the last uh, year and a half. It's a privilege to have um, Pastor Allen with us, who will be accompanying me and helping me with communion in a moment. But Jesus instructed his followers to use bread and to use wine to remember the very sacrifice that he did. When he died on the cross for our sins, in a little less than a month, we're going to be celebrating Easter. And in the weeks to come, we're going to focus a bit more on, on what Jesus did, the sacrifice, how God loves us and forgives us. We're going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in a moment, but in John chapter 6, verse 48, we, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He is the living bread that comes from heaven. And anyone, anyone, may eat and not die. Anyone can partake of this and have eternal life. It's just a question of accepting Christ into your heart as your Lord. Being able to say to Jesus, okay, I submit to you. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus says, this bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. And just before this, in John 6, 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. There's a connection between our closeness to Jesus, our faith in believing in him, and then being fulfilled by him. Because it's more than just, I believe. It's, we take communion together as brothers and sisters Jesus fills us, gives us purpose, gives us life. There's a connection between our closeness to Jesus, again, and being fulfilled by Him. The early church celebrated Jesus by taking communion. Sometimes, even every day, they would do this. They would gather together and have food and break bread in His name, in memory of Him. And sometimes it wasn't just bread and wine, it was a whole meal. They would come together, and yeah, they'd have the bread, they'd have the wine, and, and a lot of other things. It was basically a party every time. They realized that each time they got together around the table to eat and drink, it was a chance to recognize Jesus and thank God for all He's done for us. We see that a little bit when we pray and say grace before supper or a meal or lunch. We're inviting Jesus, saying, Lord, I thank you for this food. Lord, thank you for being there with me. So this morning, it's our chance, our occasion to thank and worship him. And that's why we do this. If you haven't received yet a little cup, I'm going to invite you to take them up. And if you haven't received it, raise your hand, and uh, the welcome team will come with a little basket and, uh, and, and give them to you. Oh, no. Oh, there's none left. We're out. Well... Wow, and we get a lot, we get a huge box of these things. Man, okay, so we have to order some more. <sighs> well, the ones of you who don't have it, I mean, I would say just come up after, and, or when we do it, we have extra here in the front, if you don't mind drinking from the same cup. <laughs> I'm going to invite Pastor Allen to come with me to the front. got to smell it. I'm sorry. It's... In 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together this morning. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Pastor Alan. Are we live? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a privilege, Lord, for us to to know your invitation yes. from all Thank you, Lord God. who are weary and heavy burdened and you promise us rest. Lord, you say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, through redemption, by grace, as a gift, through Jesus Christ, we are all invited to this table. And as much as we believed in you, we have authority to be called children of God. Hallelujah. Thank you for that privilege, Lord. Lord, if there is any who are uncertain, I pray that you would just spill over into their lives from your Holy Spirit a confidence that that invitation is for them as well. Father, may this remembrance, these symbols, encourage our hearts for the lives that you have called us to lead outside these walls. May you strengthen our relationships within these walls that we would be an encouragement to one another that your Holy Spirit would lead us, give us wisdom for the lives that you've uh, privileged us to, to live. And we will promise to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in the powerful name of Jesus, who said he was gentle and humble of heart. Hallelujah. Lord, you are available to all of us, and we need not fear approaching you. So I pray, Lord, that you would forgive sin, draw people to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. At the cross I bow my knee, where your blood was shed for me, there's no greater love than
ask you to bless the rest of this service, Lord, as we receive the word from Pastor Rudy, Lord. Let our hearts be open and let us receive and continue to receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Christina to come up and give us the announcements this morning. Michelle and Daniel. Email Rudy at lakeshorechurch.ca. Okay, and please bring a snack to share amongst you. Next, we have women's breakfast that's coming up. Um, this month, it's going to be scheduled at, um, sorry, it's scheduled for March 16th at 9.30 down the street at Expe Express in Dorval. Um, please remember to sign up in the back um, in the lobby or email the office at lakeshore.ca so that we know how many people to reserve for. Um, next, I think we're, I'm a bit behind. I think I'm a bit ahead of the overhead. Oh, they're down. Um, next, I want to announce that we having, we're going to have our annual general meeting that's scheduled for Sunday, April 7th, following the service. Um, it obviously, it's for members to be able to vote However, if you're a, a, a regular attendant, you're still able to attend. You just won't be able to vote. If you want to vote, though, feel free to take the next phases. Um, with a membership package, you can contact the office for that, or you can go to the back at the Welcome Hall Center. There should be packages, or we can make sure that you can get a package. Thank you. Um, if you want to know if you're able to, if you are a member, there are lists at the back and at the front um, with the list of the members so you can see if you are actually a member of the church. As well, there is one position open for um, the board this year. So if you would like to um, submit a candidate who is a member for to fill that position, please email the office at lakeshorechurch.ca by tomorrow. <laughs> Um, there will be a p retreat for the 35 for people aged 35 to 55 called the Pulse Retreat. That's scheduled to be on April 26th to the 28th. It's an overnight. Feel free to contact. Um, the details will be on the church website, so feel free to access it there. And there are two. Obviously, we have our our small groups as well. Um, the first is Basic Christianity that's being held here in the basement, um, being led by Pastor Rudy. That's every Wednesday um, at 7.30 in the basement. 
and we also have our Lakeshore Life Groups. Those are the small groups that are being held in um, houses. I think there's one in Dorval, one in Kirkland, Point Claire, and there is one on Zoom. Cont um, please feel free to visit our website for more details. At this time, um, I think we need to pr um, take this time to uh, for the offering. So, um, okay. Um, you, there's multiple ways that you can give to the church. You can go um, through the church app. There are there's the um, envelopes in front of you that you can deposit in the boxes in the front and the back. As well, you can give on um, Canada give Canada gives as well. So I'd just like to take this time to pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all of your blessings to us at this time. Lord, we just want to take this chance to give back a small portion to you. Please bless the gift and the giver, and I pray that it will just do, it will advance your kingdom and your work, not only at this church, but throughout the West Island and throughout the world. Lord, as we are going into the survey, um, into the sermon, I pray that you will just touch Pastor Rudy and help his message touch us in that we can forward, that we can, <coughs> that we will be able to live our lives in the way that you like. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And at this time, I think we can take 90 seconds to greet one another. Um, Thank you, Christina. <laughs> I'm going to invite also the youth to head downstairs with Emma for the youth sessions in the youth room. All the youth, please follow Emma through the back or the front doors for your youth session. Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you're enjoying fellowship as we uh, greet one another. Um, you know, it's fun that during a service, there's so many highlights. Every part, there's a part, and some of you prefer one part over another, but I love the 90 seconds. I, ju I just th think it's, it's great. And uh, for us to greet one another and smile and say hello and introduce ourselves to some new people, and if you are new this morning, first time to Lakeshore Church, make sure you fill out a welcome card, 
In front of your seats, there's a card that has a QR code. You can actually scan it, and you'll get the online version of the welcome card. And if you're online watching us, um, and you just want to say hello, just go to the website, click on welcome card, and introduce yourselves to us. We'd be thrilled to get to know you, at least even from a distance. Maybe one day when you'll be in Montreal, you'll uh, be able to stop by and we'll say, hey, we know you from online. Well, this morning I am uh, going to start, a, a, it's not a series, but as, we, as I said before, we're preparing at least our hearts, at least my heart, as I move forward towards Easter. And uh, Easter is just a great moment in our year where we can truly focus on, on what Jesus did for us. Christmas is great, and Christmas has another feel to it, at least for me. It's always a, an, an amazing time, and Easter, sometimes I wish Easter was further down so we could really have like, you know, six months in between, but it is what it is. So it's coming up. We have Easter, and today I want to talk about uh, a subject that Jesus um, takes a uh, um, a bit longer to talk about, and uh, he does this because you're going to see Peter uh, asks a question that could have been answered real quick, and it is answered pretty quickly, but then Jesus expands on it, which he often does using a parable. We're going to look at the book of Matthew, and we're going to look at chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, and this is the, the famous chapter, the, the part where Peter asks Jesus this mathematical question. And some of you may have wondered, oh, no, pastor, I don't like math. And uh, it's true, there's a lot of math we learned in high school. I get these memes, right, saying, you know, some people, you know, by the time you die, you're all happy because I never used the Pythagorean theorem through my life, right? And uh, most of us would never use that. But we learned it somewhere in grade 10 or grade 11. Well, this is a math part that uh, Jesus does, and he wants us to remember this one because ultimately... The number actually doesn't matter, which is kind of, kind of good. Let me just open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing this morning. We ask your anointing on your word, Jesus, that it would challenge us, Lord, that it would bring us closer to you and just bring us to a place where we can better understand you, Jesus, and what you're calling for us in our life. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 18 is where we see Jesus talking about becoming like little children in, in the beginning of the chapter, where welcoming little children in his name is like welcoming him. He continues in the chapter about being very careful not to cause one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble. And he flows into what causes us to stumble and how to take care of it. He talks about the wandering sheep and how to deal with sin in the church. And then in verse 20, the famous line, For where there are two or three gather, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And then as the disciples are around Jesus, they're listening to his words, they're listening to his discourse, they're, they're, they're listening to everything he, he's saying that is so you know, a profound, it's, it's so intense, it's so, I mean, half of them don't get it anyway, it's still flying over their heads, but it's like, wow, Jesus is speaking. Peter decides to pipe in, right, Peter, good old Peter, he's like, and, and, and he decides to pipe in, and so in verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how many times? Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? What a Peter. Jesus is talking. He's saying parables. He's giving some good meat. And Peter feels, oh, I, I, oh, I just, you know, I, it's almost like a kid who's wriggling in, wriggling in his chair, wanting to say something. Oh, 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 oh. And Peter's like, oh. Jesus, by the way, how many times should, we, should I, 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 I forgive my brother or sister? And Jesus answered him right away, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And some versions have 70 times seven times. And then Jesus tells this story. So we're going to come back in a moment to what, what, what Peter is asking, what Peter is saying. But then Jesus says this story. And so here we have this story. 
you know, Peter and the disciples are all sitting there. They're all waiting, and this massive story, and you'll understand what I mean by massive. It's, it's huge. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Oh, be patient with me, he begged. I, I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt, and he let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, you scoundrel. It, it doesn't say that. I added that. But, but you can almost imagine the... Uh, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Oh, but he refused. Oh, no. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. It doesn't make sense, right, when you read this. I throw you into prison until you can pay the debt. But you're in prison. How are you going to pay the debt? Anyway, I, it's me. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Verse 32, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then verse 35, Jesus concludes the story and I'm sure that Peter and the disciples are all kind of like, like they're stunned. This is heavy. And he says in verse 35, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. That's a heavy story. You know, there's some stories you read and, and you really get a picture, but this one is, it's heavy and, and, and it's, it's, it's massive in the amounts of, 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 of money they're talking about. I mean, it's just a story, but still. But there's two viewpoints in this story, right? We're going to look at the viewpoint from the forgiver side, the person who forgives, and then from the person who, who, who is asking to be forgiven, the um, forgiven side, I guess, right? The forgiver side, we see that there's an act of forgiving that must be done continuously. There is no point in time when one has asked to be forgiven too many times. And then from the person asking to be forgiven, the truth is that they will most probably fall and fail and disappoint, and they will be in need of forgiveness more than once. It's interesting to notice that Peter's question shows that actually Peter had understood the concept of forgiveness. He had understood it somewhat, right? At least that's what Peter thinks. He, he, he figured, oh man, I can't wait. I, I'm going to ask Jesus this question. And, uh, and, and he's not trying to be coy. He's not trying to be arrogant. He's not trying to be, you know, proud or, wow, I've, I understood stuff. I, I think Peter is honestly trying to, to please Jesus and in, in trying to be generous in his understanding, right? I think Peter's in that, in that state. He doesn't ask if he should or not forgive someone. That's not what he says. He's understood the concept that he should be forgiving, he assumes that he gets the principle. Peter was probably thinking of the rabbinic consensus, which said that a brother should be forgiven three times for a repeated sin. On the fourth time, there was no forgiveness, right? It's the three times and you're out rule, right? We use this with our kids, some of us. You know, I'm going to count to three, you know, and it's one, two, three. Three, you're out, right? It's not three and a half. It's not three and a quarter. It's not four. Three, boom, you're out. 
whatever that means. Parents, you figure it out. But Peter is thinking to himself, he's thinking, I'm going to be big hearted. I, I'm going to propose, because I, I understand we're supposed to forgive three times. I'm going to more than double it. I'm going to say seven times. It's more than twice the accepted rule. And he thinks that by saying seven times, he's being generous, right? He's being like Jesus. And that Jesus will look at him and go, wow, Peter, you got it. I was going to say five times, but hey, you said seven. That's even better. Peter, high five. Boop. You know, he thinks, oh, man, I, this is... I mean, Jesus is talking about all these stories and parables. I'm going to pipe in. I'm going to show that I'm getting it, right? I'm finally understanding what Jesus is saying. So he more than doubles the consensus. Seven times, right, Jesus? <laughs> oh, boy. And, and Jesus answers him with another, hand, with another number, Right? We have to be careful sometimes not to think that we're doing too much. It's a trap to believe that we're doing a lot as a Christian, that we're doing much service, that we're doing much loving, that we're doing, you know, much forgiving, that we're really being kind and, and, and generous. It's common to believe that we may be doing too much, you know, but Lord, I'm doing so much for you, especially in thinking that we are forgiving too much. That maybe we ought to be more strict in our forgiveness, right? And, and, and you know, to teach somebody a lesson, right? I'm going to forgive them, but, but I need to teach them, you know, a lesson in there. And, you know, the three times, and you're out rule. Sorry, bud. You know, I mean, I mean, I've been forgiving you, but you've exceeded the amount of times I can forgive you. We need to always keep in mind that we have so much that has been forgiven us. And Peter, Peter is stretching it. He thinks, oh, Lord, I, I don't want to just do what, what I think I should do. I, I want to do more. I think I'm offering more. Seven, it's a pretty good number as well, seven, you know. And, uh, hmm. and you have to notice this, too, that Christ answers Peter directly. He does not answer Peter in a parable. That comes after. Peter asks a question or gives a statement and a question, and, and Jesus answers him right away. He says, I tell you, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. His answer, his statement, has no room to be misunderstood. Christ is not trying to say something with a hidden message or something that only a few will understand or something that is veiled that not all will get right away. No, when his answer to Peter is, boom, right in his face. It's like, uh-uh, Peter, nice try, but you don't have it. It's not seven times. It's seven times 70. It's, it's just like a huge amount. And then he's going to go into a story, and he does the story. The statement is direct. There's no beating around the bush. The story comes right after his answer. And his answer is twofold. He says not seven times because he wants to make sure there is no ground for a precedent. He wants to establish that there are no bounds. There are no limits. And then he adds, but 77 times. Some translations have 70 times 7, 490. The Greek in this case can be taken only barely to mean seven times 70. It follows the Septuagint in Genesis 4.24 to render the Hebrew number 77. But the meaning, though, is obviously not centered on a specific amount. Jesus is not trying to say, start to count. You know, and when you reach 76, oh, 77, oh, and then you're out. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to give you a number just to blow your brains. It's like, it's not seven times. It's seven times 70 times. It's like... There's no stopping. There's no limit. There's no longevity. Peter was looking for a firm rule on this, and Jesus knocks it out of the park. The idea here is to replace a definite number 7 by an indefinite number 77. He doesn't want us to keep count of the offenses made against us. Really? Jesus, you don't want us to, to keep count of the offenses that people do against me? But, but Lord, I, you gave me something called a brain and a memory. 
right? It, it's still there. In the story that Jesus tells right after, he will talk about a debt, an iniquity. There's a point of dissension. The master calls the servant, and he tells him the debt must be paid. The servant begs for patience, asks to be forgiven. The master takes pity. He loves the servant, and he cancels the debt, and then the servant is free. But then the servant must do likewise. He's got to do the same thing. The debt, the issue, the iniquity is canceled. It is forgiven. It is erased. It is forgotten. There's also two sacrifices in this. The forgiver. (laughs) Well, they must sacrifice. They must accept to put their pride aside, accept to put their rights aside. Although justice is on the forgiver's side, although the forgiver has all the rights to send the other servant to jail, he's got all the rights. To condemn the other, he's got the rights. To sue him, to ask for damages, to be repaid, to not forgive him. The forgiver must put all that aside and humble himself because there is a price to pay. A huge price, and it is not easy. It is not easy to forgive. It is never something light. When you forgive somebody else, it is not something easy or light to do. If it was easy to forgive, then Christ literally could have come on a cloud. You know, he could have been floating through the air on this amazing anti-gravity snowboard or skateboard, and he could have hovered over people and go, hey, everybody, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. It's that easy. You just have to look up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And it would have just been like that. You know? It would have been a very kumbaya moment, and Jesus would have, ah. That's not what happened, right? We're going to see this when we come to Easter. There was a price to pay, a huge, huge price to pay. It wasn't a light act. It was not flippant. God didn't just send Jesus. Jesus, yeah, just go for a stroll. Yeah, just, just, just wave your hand, tell them they're all forgiven. That's not what happened. There was a huge price to pay. In the story that Jesus tells, the parable, I don't know if you ever stopped to really think about it. I did. I've done this before. Many pastors have. Some of you have. But to go calculate the cost of the talents, right? The gold, 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 talents that the servant owed the master. This is a, a huge, huge amount. A talent back then was worth about, now get this, 20 years of a day laborer's wages. 20 years of salary was one talent, one bag of gold. 20 years worth of you working. That's 200,000 years. Wow. That's a huge amount. It blows your mind. It's like, whoa, 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 10,000 talents. Sounds small, 10,000 talents. That's like $10,000. No. In financial terms, 10,000 talents is about 330,000 kilograms of gold or 330 metric tons. Last week, on Thursday, gold was worth about 93 thousand dollars a kilo i know people go by ounce (laughs) i didn't have time to do ounces let's just go to kilo you know how much that is that's over 30 billion dollars of gold the servant owed over 30 billion dollars even if you were to half that oh pastor that's too much of an amount let's do it 15 billion Forget billion. Let's go to million. Let's do 30 million. That's still a huge amount. It was huge. I mean, his own life would not even suffice to pay back back the debt. They would have had to sell his wife and all his kids and all his household and all his possessions. And even that, you know, would not have sufficed. It would not have even come close to paying back the debt of the servant. And so when you hear the master in the story going, I have pity on you because I know There is nothing you can do to be forgiven. There is nothing you can do. You will never have this amount of money. 
if you lived 200,000 years and worked every single day and gave me all that money, okay, maybe then. But it, 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 it's senseless. Like, it doesn't make sense. The servant owed way, way, way too much that he could ever pay back to the master. Jesus is using a huge number that will blow the brains of, of, of the disciples. Peter's probably going, ah, 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 how much is that? Oh, oh. Like, that's huge. Forgiveness is not easy. There's a huge cost to it. Sometimes we answer someone, oh, it's okay. You know, don't worry about it, it's nothing. When somebody asks for forgiveness. But this sometimes reveals actually uh, an unforgiving heart because it may even show an unyielding heart in which the one who should be forgiving doesn't really want to be bothered or doesn't really want to face the issue or the circumstance or the why. And they kind of flippantly, oh, it's okay, You're, yeah, it's, it's okay, don't worry about it. And sometimes we do that because we don't know what to do with it. So we kind of, oh, okay. Or, or, or simply, we, we, we don't want to humble ourselves to forgive because to forgive, it, we're not coming above somebody. We're coming almost under them where we're basically saying, oh, man, I can't go get the justice. I can't go get what, 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 what should be given to me. I can't go get that. i got to put that aside to forgive the other person. Sometimes they simply brush it off. But if you do this, this will stay in the person and it will brew because you haven't truly forgiven them. So that's bad. It's not good. It's bad. Forgiveness is not easy. It comes with a cost, a cost to the forgiver. From the forgiven's point of view, they also must humble themselves. They must go and ask. And they have to allow to be thought of as... Well, as I messed up, I screwed up, I, 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 I did something bad, right? They have to, to, be, to lower themselves. Their pride obviously cannot be present. They risk losing their esteem in the other's eyes. They expose themselves and they, they expose their wrongdoing to the other person, even making themselves maybe subject to the law. They may even risk their rights, freedom and privileges. There is a price to be paid. It's not easy to ask somebody for forgiveness. It's not easy. Remember that the master in the story lost 10,000 talents. He lost $30 billion. But it's so easy to think that time will erase all things. If a wrongdoing is not taken care of, you know what happens? The guilt will never disappear. And so that's bad too. You can't ignore when you've wronged somebody else. You need to go to them and tell them, listen, I've, I, I've messed up. I've wronged you. Sometimes they're not aware of it right away, but usually they are. And then it's on them, yes, to go through in their mind and their heart, okay, I've got to forgive my brother or my sister. There's an attitude that we have to check. In verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. No strings attached. Oh, not I'll forgive, but I won't forget, right? Because we do this, right? We're, humans are pretty good at that, right? I'll forgive, but I won't forget. No, it's a decision of the mind, and also it must be a decision of the heart. You should forget. You should have the attitude to not think or remember the issue that must be forgiven. Of course, just like the master and the servant, if something reoccurs, you'll probably remember the previous event. That's human memory. But at that point, guess what? Well, then you should forgive again. And the point of the story, it's not a question that the master doesn't forgive the servant who's messed up. No, it's because the servant's attitude and heart was a, a choice not to forgive others. And so he was thrown into jail. When you do likewise, it will be remembered. Then the master called the servant in. I'm sorry, when you don't do likewise. Phew, right? So when you don't do likewise. Verse 32, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. 
I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay all he owed. Another thing, don't advance or give forgiveness when the other person has not asked for it. It's a little arrogant to do that, right? That kind of gets your pride. Oh, I forgive them. Did they ask for forgiveness? No. It's not, hey, I forgive you, you know, and they don't know what you're talking about. It'll actually have a, a reverse effect. It will affect the relationship. The other person will wonder, huh, what's happening? Uh, what did I do? Uh, why are you forgiving me? What's got into that brother or that sister? Who do they think they are? Hey, this may be taken flippantly, and the other might be saying, I forgive you, but because it hasn't really been properly addressed, it, it, it actually the forgiveness may not even be there, really. Just before, in verse 15, we're advised to confront the one who has sinned against you. If your brother or sister sins, it says, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. What it's saying is you need to communicate, you need to talk from both sides You may be in the position where you know you've offended, you've hurt, you've disappointed, you've sinned against your brother or sister. Go talk to them. It may be that you don't know what you've done, but they've they've received it. Go talk to them. Just you and them. Say, hey, bruh, sister, you know, last week, something you said, something you did, I we need to talk about it because it really affected me. It hurt me. It offended me. It, It, you know, I mean. It wasn't right. Have that conversation. Bring the other person to a point where they can reflect and understand and think, oh, I did that, right? But you need to communicate. You need to talk. As we try to wrap our minds around the story, we see how the first part represents how much God has forgiven us our sins and the cost to Him. It was huge. There is nothing. You know, the story talks about 30 billion, 10,000 bags of gold. There's nothing, the story reflects and reveals that there's nothing we could do to be forgiven. There's nothing. There's, There's no amount of work. There's no amount of prayer. There's no amount of climbing upstairs on your knees until they bleed to get to the top of the church. There's none of that sacrifice, there's none of that. There's no amount. Your very life is not sufficient. Your very life and your family's is not sufficient. There is nothing we can do to earn forgiveness. It is a gift. It is given to us from Jesus. He is the giver. He is our gift. It's too huge. The cost being His Son, that's the cost, who died on the cross for each of our sins, each of us. And again, this is huge. It's, like I said, it's, it's, it's unfathomable how huge it is. And so Jesus in the story just, just throws in some math, throws in some numbers for Peter and the disciples to understand, hey, this is what I did for you. Now this is what you need to do for others. It's going to be on a much smaller scale. It's not your life. It's going to be much smaller scale, Right? Because the second part is a much smaller amount in comparison. It still remains pretty large for us. And that's why I said forgiving others is not easy. There is a cost. But it, it's, it's an understandable cost. He had to forgive the other servants, his servant, 100 silver coins or 100 denarii. That represents today for us, it's about $11,000. One denarius was about equivalent to one day of a laborer's wage. A Roman soldier is also, that's what they got. That, that was their daily pay. They got one denarius, one silver coin, one. And so he's told to forgive his servant who owes him 100 little silver coins. It's, it's not a small amount. It's not insignificant. Today's money, it's about 11, 
a thousand bucks. Day, a laborer's wage today, on the low end, about hundred and fifteen dollars a day, times a hundred, eleven thousand five hundred. The idea is, it's not so small that you just peh, flippantly brush it off. It's a sizable amount, but it's not thirty billion dollars. So, buddy, you can do it. Eleven thousand, yeah, yeah, you can forgive that. Easy. Not simple, and yes, for us, not that easy, but you, you must do it. For us to be able to forgive others is doable. It's attainable. In comparison to what Jesus did for us, it is actually a small thing. Maybe it can be large or big from our point of view. And yes, it's not easy. And yes, there is a cost, but definitely one that we can do and must. We must forgive. It's part of who we are. We talk about we must love, right? We talk about we are, as believers, we go and, you know, Jesus calls us to love. Yay! But what if they hurt us? Oh, oh I, I got to love them too. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, you're going to have to forgive them. Oh, you have to talk to them. Oh, no, no, come on. Yeah, you're going to have to have that conversation. Then you're going to have to talk. Then you're going to have to forgive. And then you're going to have to love. And it's like, oh, that's what Jesus did. Christ doesn't just forgive us and let us go. He gives us the help we need not to sin again. He gives us His Word. He equips us with His armor. He gives us His guidance. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He does not expect us to do it without His help. He does give us help to do it. Likewise, if a brother or sister wrongs you or does something wrong, see how you can help. See how someone can help. Talk with them. Sometimes just that communication is enough just to get you there. Basically, Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, you need to be predisposed, ready to forgive every day, all the time. Here are some points to take home today. Forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness is an active part of love. They go together. Why did Jesus forgive us? Because he loves us. It's not because he had to. It's not because, oh, what? I got to forgive him? Okay, I forgive you. No, it's because he loved us, and I love you, and oh, man, we're separated. Oh, a sin, oh, I forgive you. Just, just let's connect, right? Forgiveness is essential to Christian unity. This is big. This is big, especially today. It was big 2,000 years ago. It was big in the early church. It's been big throughout church history. It's still big today. Why? Because Christian unity is so important. Unity here within the church, amongst many churches, right? In our nation, we need Christian unity. We need to be of the same mind that understand what love is and forgiveness. We must be predisposed, ready and willing to forgive. Jesus makes it clear to Peter that there is no limit. There is no limit. It's not seven times. It's not 77 times. It's just, you can't count it, Peter. Don't even bother. You don't have enough fingers to count it upon. It's just, you're going to do this all the time. The consequences of not forgiving others Remember what Jesus tells Peter in verse 35. He says, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers or sister from your heart. Be thrown in jail. Oh, but Jesus is love. Yes. And he calls us to love and to forgive. And, and if we don't, guess what? We don't find ourselves in a good situation. Let me finish this morning with a poem written by a lady called Mary Horner. She wrote a book called Amen, Devotions in Rhyme. And she says this, <clears throat> Forgiveness could very well be the hardest task Christians face. There are so many factors involved that can hinder its taking place. Sometimes it just seems impossible because the hurt is so deep. Like a wounded animal, all we want to do is lick our wounds and weep. Often our pride gets in the way. We think we can't be forgetters. We're convinced that getting even will surely make us feel better. Many times it's other people who get in our way of forgiving, 
They mean well, but they give us bad advice for the life we should be living. To forgive, we must first realize that forgiveness is a gift from God. We are totally incapable on our own without His spiritual prod. He must come, we must come to grips with the fact, even in the midst of our strife, that forgiveness is a powerful witness to the grace of God in our life. By refusing this gift of forgiveness, our chances are very, very slim of having the kind of relationship God wants us to have with Him. Unforgiveness, like a strong acid, hurts the person on whom it's poured, but it always does more damage to the vessel in which it's stored. We need to show forgiveness. Jesus stopped what he was doing, answered Peter directly, not in a parable, said, Peter, nice try, but it's not seven times. It's seven times, 70 times. Then he gives the story. Because Peter, you can't go thinking about numbers. You can't go, because to think about numbers and counting means you remember what's happened. Oh yeah, you did this again. Oh, this is the again, you did it. This is the fifth time. Now this is the sixth time. You can't do this. You go and forgive your brother, your sister. Something happens again. Okay. You're released. They're released. And love abounds. And both grow stronger in the presence of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. We close in a word of prayer. And I encourage you to go home and, and think about forgiveness. You may have people in your lives that you know. Mm. Oh, and you know, and you're going, Pastor, why'd you have to preach this today? Ah, I'm going to have to go home and think about this now. <sighs> and some of you are on the other end. You're like, oh, man, I know I messed up. I know I hurt my sister. I know I hurt my brother. Lord, give me the strength to go in and just confront them and, and, shh, and apologize and ask them for their forgiveness. Whichever camp you're in, don't hold on to it. Learn how to forgive. And maybe today you're in need of camp. Life is good. No one's hurt you. And, uh, but still, be predisposed to forgiving others. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your, <laughs> Lord, for your forgiveness. Your forgiveness, Lord, that is so huge. It's not just a forgiving of, of the things we do wrong. It's the forgiving our essential nature that we are born sinners, that there is nothing, Lord, we could do, could have done, change. We are the way we are, and yet, Lord, you have come to free us, to forgive us, to love us. And, Lord, we, I accept that. I want that in my life. I thank you for that, Jesus. Lord, may I in turn learn to do this with my brothers and my sisters, the people around me, that your love may be released through me that people would see what forgiveness is and above all, see you and your love. So, Father, we thank you for this day. Equip us, give us the strength, enable us, prod us, speak to us. And, Lord, may we be obedient to your voice. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.